Welcome to the And She Looked Up Creative Hour podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Hartfield, and I'm an artist and an entrepreneur. And yes, those two things can go together. This podcast is for the artists, the creatives, and the makers who want to find a way to make a living doing what they love. Hey everybody, it's Melissa here and I'm just popping in at the beginning to give you all a heads up. You're going to notice at the beginning of this episode that Heather and I mentioned that we're going to be talking about uh, what happened in our art businesses in 2020 and then looking forward to our goals for our art businesses in 2021. And what happened while we were recording the episode is that we realized we were actually recording two separate episodes. So this episode, as the title states, is really going to be about uh, re- reviewing what happened in 2020 with our art businesses and next week we'll be back and we'll be sitting down and talking about our concrete goals for 2021 with our art businesses so just to clear up any confusion you might have at the beginning <laughs> and now on with the show Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the And She Looked Up Creative Hour podcast. I'm Melissa, and as always, I'm your host. And Heather Travis is back with me this week for her December guest appearance. Hey, Heather. (laughs) Hi. And I'm really excited about what we're going to be talking about today. So if you joined us last week, you know that Angelina Brogan and I talked a lot about goal setting for your small business in 2021. And today, Heather and I are going to be talking sort of about goals, but what we're really focusing in on is how we plan to grow our art businesses in 2021. So we're going to get really specific. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation because whenever Heather and I talk about our art businesses, I always get a ton of new ideas. So I'm looking Me forward too. to that. Yeah. So, um, before we dive in, just to give everyone a little background, especially if you're new here. So Heather and I have both run our own small businesses for a long time, but we're not going to be talking today about our services based business. So if you don't know, Heather is a PR and communication specialist. She has her own business in that sphere. We're not talking about that today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm a, a graphic designer and do other small business services. We're not talking about that today. We are strictly talking about our art businesses. So Heather is a painter who focuses mainly on large scale canvases and murals, although she does other things, which I'm sure we'll talk a little Mm -hmm. bit about today. (laughs) And I'm an illustrator who works mainly in markers and ink. And so Heather's very large scale. I'm very small scale in terms of the size of the works that we produce. It's a perfect pairing though. (laughs) And I think it would be very fair to say before we dive into this, that we, while both of us have been creating art for years, decades, um, and while we may have both sold pieces here and there, I think it would be fair to say that when it comes to selling our art and having an art business, we're both fairly new to the game. We're novices, I think that would be fair to say. Um, Yes. Very enthusiastic ones, though. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Super, super keen, but very green behind the ears. (laughs) So we're going to talk a little bit about um what worked for us this year and what happened for us this year and the things we're happy with and the things that we learned and all of that stuff and then we're going to dive into what we're hoping to accomplish in 2021 so those of you out there who paint who make who sew who create whatever it is that you create Mm -hmm. this is i think an episode for all of you because that's what we're really going to be talking about selling your physical art or creations however you want to classify it I know some people hear the word art and they think highbrow and that's not (laughs) what we're necessarily talking about here today good lord no no and I would say I hope too that even if you don't necessarily have an art business yet I hope that hearing the things that Melissa and I have done knowing that we're both relative newbies to being in the art business 
I hope that some of the things that we talk about inspire you to maybe take that step forward and do something new that lunges you in that direction because it's a really cool place to be. Yeah, I hope so too because I know whenever you're starting something brand new, we tend to look at the people who are really far ahead of us and we Mm -hmm. see how accomplished they are and how successful they are and we think, oh my gosh, that's never going to be me. So I think Heather and I are going to be pretty honest. (laughs) today yep. about <laughs> how things have gone for us and uh and it's it's not easy and it's a huge learning curve um but I think it's one that we've both immensely enjoyed so let's dive in yeah. so Heather at the beginning of 2021 what were your plans in terms of your art or did you have any Oh God, the beginning of this year was a a big year for me. Last year, so 2019, we moved and I, our house that we live in now has a studio and the purpose of moving here to this house, to this area was for me to expand my art business and to really take this leap forward. And so 2020 was a big year for me because I I knew going into it, I really had to put my business hat on because... While the studio is part of our house, long term, what we're trying to do is make that studio space completely cost justified by my art. So the quote rent that's paid on that as part of our mortgage, all the bills that go into heating it, all of those things, like I have to pay for that space with my art. And that's very different than just painting on the living room floor and mm. being being happy I sold it to a friend, right? So I re- this was a big year for putting my my big girl business hat on um and that was a a big big challenge but really exciting and I I really enjoyed the pressure actually I really enjoyed the pressure um so it was a big one for me yeah what about for you how what what did you (laughs) set up when you because because I know and I know that when we I mean years ago and forever people were encouraging you to get Miss Doodle just off Instagram and somewhere else right and so this was the year that she she did. Miss Doodle left the platform and went to Etsy. Yeah. So actually, Miss Doodle arrived on Etsy in December of 2019. And I had Ooh. been, um, yeah, but there was no plan. So, <laughs> um, so people had been asking me, people who, who were following me on Instagram for quite a while. And I don't have a big Instagram following. I have about 1,900 people. Um, but, but the people who have been there have been very loyal. And they had been asking me, for quite a while to do something with Miss Doodle, who is a little character that I created as part of a 100-day project four or five years ago. She's been around for a long time. And I was really curious about it, and I started doing a lot of research because I didn't want to put a product out there that I wouldn't buy myself. And so I did a lot of research into papers and inks and all that kind of stuff. And... Part of that was probably a little bit of procrastination on my part because I was very afraid to put her out there for sale. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and not not just because I wasn't worried that people would buy her, but I was also, she was really fun for me. And I didn't yes. want, I wasn't sure I wanted to cross that line from having something that was really fun and enjoyable and a stress reliever for me and yes. turning it into a business. But a lot of people really did want some prints. And so I thought, you know what, I will put a few prints up in December for Christmas and people can buy them if they, they, they want. And we'll just see what happens. And I think I had four prints and a, I, I may have had my typewriter sticker up in December. I can't remember. Um, and I sold seven prints to four customers. Amazing. Which I, I was thrilled. Like the fact that people wanted to buy a print of my work was like amazing to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And so so I sold those and then December 25th rolled around and I completely forgot about Etsy. (laughs) (laughs) I had no plans for it for 2020. Um, My focus was very much on this podcast. When Lisa and I started it, the podcast was just meant to be part of a much larger business plan, which included doing live creative retreats and then COVID-19 hit and that was the end of the (laughs) creative live retreats and it wasn't really until um May somebody bought something from me on Etsy just out of the blue and I was like oh yeah 
I should get back on that platform and sell more stuff. Yeah, so, and I had another sale in June, and June is when my mastermind group sits down and reviews our goals for the year, like sort of a halfway checkpoint. And that was when I actually sat down and made goals for myself. And I wanted to um, have 100 sales by the end of the year. And I wanted to add a new product to my Etsy shop every week for the rest of the years. And I didn't hit either of those goals. I came very I was, was going to ask you because I feel like you've come close to it, though. Um, I am very close to the product per week. I am. I think I went from four products to 25 so not quite one a week but but close yeah um and I didn't add them every week I added them in batches here and there Mm -hmm. but it worked out and then I'm at 46 sales on Etsy and then I have also done a number of private sales which I did not tally up but I want to say it was probably about nine or ten private sales so um So yeah, so that's where I am. I'm not unhappy. Um, I had hoped I would do a little bit better in terms of sales, but I still Mm -hmm. make 46 46 sales of my art. So, so my God, yeah. (laughs) To be just so people understand, if you're not on the Etsy platform, um, a sale is different from a customer. So if one person in one transaction buys a print, a sticker, and a greeting card, that's three sales. Right. But if they buy a print, a sticker, and two of the same greeting card, so they buy four items, that's still three sales. So it's three different SKUs. So oh, 40, interesting. I know, it's weird, and it took me a while to figure that out. So 46 sales is, I think, worked out to 27 orders when I was looking at Etsy this morning. So, um, awesome. So I'm not unhappy, but I had hoped I, w- I had wanted to do a little bit better. So, um, mm-hmm. But that's a big learning process. Etsy as a whole ecosystem unto itself which I'm still very much learning how to learning yeah how to to work my way through so um which kind of brings me to the next question we were going to talk about is where where did you sell your art in 2020 well 2020 was an interesting one because when I when I set out in the year some of my goals included going to basically every farmer's market every summer craft show right um, I had I had <laughs> planned on doing a lot and I had done and and we talked about it I think in our very first episode together around the research but I had done all of that research and all of that legwork and I went to every single goddamn farmer's market two summers ago in the hopes that you know to scope it out like is this a place for me for my art and I'd gone to all the different galleries and I'd done all the research and then boom, you know, galleries were shutting down, all the farmer's markets were closed this summer, or if they were open, they were not having, you know, what I would call sort of extra people, like the artists in a booth. Mm -hmm. They were just having the farmer's, like actual farmer's market people, um, which is totally fair. And so I really had to switch and I tackled, so I have my website, I sell art through there, but I sold art a lot through my Instagram And when we talk about 2021, that's for sure one of my bigger goals is, in fact, I'm looking at, because I've got my business hat on, I pay a lot to have an e-commerce website. But in fact, I drive so many sales through social media that I'm wondering if I can remove the e-commerce portion and save the fees and just do it. But, But then that eliminates. I don't know. There's so many, so many things to think about. So I sold art on my website. I sold a lot through social media. Um, I sold qu- a couple of pieces. What I'm looking at my numbers now. I sold four pieces through um, gallery shows, which was amazing for me. Um, a lot of in person, so like great commissions, and then the murals that I did. Obviously, those were in person sales because um, I physically had to go into the businesses to paint the murals. But um, it was all over the place. And then this year. I launched um, both a Redbubble and then very recently, like literally a week and a half ago, a Society6 shop. So I'm on both Redbubble and Society6 um, selling products there as well. So it's been a, there's lots of income coming from, I'll reframe that. (laughs) There's income coming from (laughs) lots of places. Yeah, yeah, and I think we're going to talk about Society6 and Redbubble in a moment, because I have questions for you about that. Mm-hmm. That's 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 one um, area where you've 
gone in a different direction for me and I'm very curious about it so yeah for me I sold on Etsy and through my personal social media so (laughs) um, I I don't have anything set up on my social media that allows people to click a button and buy Mm -hmm. Um, so I did a number of commissions from people who contacted me through my personal like friends and like people who are part of my personal Facebook network not my page or anything like that and I got a few commissions through Instagram and I also did um which we'll talk a little bit more about later, but I did a a pre order for boxed Christmas cards where I encouraged people to contact me directly, and that was in part because I was trying to avoid Etsy fees, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is something maybe we should talk about because you just mentioned it in your um, talking about whether or not you wanted to have an e commerce store, mm-hmm. and adding an e commerce commerce store is on my list for 2021 I want to have a platform off Etsy that I own Um, but one of the things that's really uh, can be a big shock to your system (laughs) is the fees that are involved in selling your work and this happens every I mean Etsy has some very hefty fees they have a listing fee they have a restocking fee they have a commission like it 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 adds up quite quickly Mm -hmm. Um, And then even if you have your own e-commerce store, you still have to pay credit card fees. Um, And I don't know, your e-commerce store is through Wix, I believe. Yes. Right? So do they have like a transaction fee as well on top of a credit card fee? So interestingly, what I've done on my Wix site, and this is where I'm having trouble right now trying to figure out like what is the business solution so right now in order to have it so that people can add things to a cart on my website and purchase things and they feel like they're buying on my website I pay for a premium Wix membership which is 400 smackaroos a year Mm -hmm. and that doesn't even give me the ability like I could hook up a payment processing to accept credit card and all of that but then I still have those fees on top of that $400. And so what I've done is the made it offline payment. So you can buy on my website and then you get a note saying, thank you for your purchase. In order to make sure that it's actually yours, you have to send an e-transfer to Heather at this email address, which, which then, and you and I have discussed this. I've lost a few people because you know, it's my paintings are, are not insignificant dollars. And so some people prefer to put that on a credit card or they don't have the funds available to do an e-transfer and I've, and I've lost the sale, Mm -hmm. um, because they couldn't enter a credit card information or they didn't want to send, you know, some person on the internet an e-transfer, which is totally fine. Um, but I, I am. And so one of the things that I'm looking at for 2021 is connecting it to like Instagram shop and Facebook shop, but then that needs to drive back to an e-commerce site. And so this is where I'm trying to figure out what is the, what's the return on investment? Like how heavily do I focus on that? Because, and as you were talking, I remembered another place I made a sale, a couple of sales in fact, and this goes back to an episode that you and I talked to on collaboration and, and reaching out within your community is I sold a bunch of paintings because I was in a local restaurant. So they had my paintings hanging and people could see them when they came in for takeout and all of that. And while I didn't sell any paintings to anybody physically in the restaurant, it was seeing them in the restaurant that then drove them to my site to say, I saw your painting in this restaurant and now I'm here to buy or now I'm here to commission. Mm. Um, And so in fact, I got two sales and two commissions as a result of being in that restaurant. So that's just another... Yes. Interesting. Yes. yes. And just in terms of connecting the dots. Um, but yeah, the e-commerce thing's really tricky because there's so many fees involved. Um, and it doesn't and... matter where you go through. If you have a Shopify no. site, you pay a monthly fee. If Correct. you take funds in from PayPal, PayPal takes a percentage of that um, because you're a business account. And that's just what they do. So yeah. that's, and this is one of the interesting things that I've really learned about a lot of the sellers on Etsy. There are a lot of people who sell on Etsy who don't who who it is the, it is a hobby. They they're not doing it as a business and they're not necessarily diving in and actually working out if they're making a profit. And you can tell just by the way their their items are priced. Mm-hmm. And and now knowing the fees that are involved and what shipping costs, a lot of people include shipping in the cost of their product. 
um, you just, you know, like they're just not making any money. <laughs> um, and that's something really important to realize before you sell your art is that if you put something for sale for $25, let's say you don't get the full $25 regardless, <clears throat> like whether, whether they pay you via PayPal, whether they pay you with a credit card, depending on your bank, it may even be whether they pay you by e-transfer. <laughs> like, yeah. like there is somebody is going to take a snippet of that for themselves. And for sure. there are listing fees. There are, uh, if you're on a platform like Etsy or eBay or any of those places, if you're in a gallery, there's a commission, like there's, there's somebody who is going to get a piece of the pie for sure, no matter how you slice it. So yeah. that's, that's something to be really aware of. And it can be quite shocking yeah, <laughs> the and, first time and, you sell something and see all that money dribble away in fees. No kidding. <laughs> yes. And that's, so I've had a, a number of gallery sales. One of the gallery shows I'm participating in right now, um, the paintings are being sold for 160. I make a hundred. So I lose $60 off of that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do no advertising. They take all the photography, they put yes. it up on their website, they manage all of the sales, they have all the fees for all the transactions being handled. So like they're absorbing a huge amount of cost. It's not like they just make $60 off of my, and I, as the artist understand that. And yes. then another gallery, it's 35%, um, because all of my paintings are over $500, they're taking 35%. If they were under $500, they'd be taking 30%. Mm. Um, and, and which is fine. So I could adjust my pricing if I wanted to, um, but I chose not to. But and I understand like they have rent to pay. They do a huge amounts of local yeah. attract. Like they're so those fees are are they're going towards something. Somebody's not just making money off of your. And I think that's as an artist, you need to realize that people are not making. Most people are not just making money off of your back. There's actual. Like there's a reason the fees are there. <laughs> there's a reason the fees are there totally. to help you make that sale. Totally. Right? Not begrudging the fees, but no. it is just very much a, if you if you go into this and just think that, like I said, you're going to put this up for $25 and you're going to wind up with $25 in your bank account when it sells, that's not how it works. So you do have to yeah. be really, you do have to approach it like a business. You have to think about what it costs you to make that painting, mm -hmm. both from a yeah. supply perspective and your time. And then you have to be very aware of, you know, where you're going to sell it and what percentage of that sale price is going to go to, yes. to the, to the host, to the gallery, to the payment processor, all those things. And it's, um, yeah. <laughs> it, and well, and so in, in terms of even my, so my studio space previously, when I paint, when I would paint, you know, quote, quote on a painting, if somebody said, how much would this, uh, like a commission of this size cost, I would look at my supply for, you know, the canvas and linen for the stretcher frame for all of the paints. And then I would think to myself, okay, how much, you know, approximate time is this taking me plus just, you know, fees for original art. But now looking, I have, I have an entire studio space that I need to pay for. Mm -hmm. And so I have heat on that. I have insurance on that space. I have now have, uh, like professional commercial insurance because of my mural side, like physically going onto people's properties. I have insurance that goes along with that. Yeah. That's a fee. And so all of those now are hard costs baked into the price of that painting. Yes. Because that's what it costs me to get it out there. And it, it might be cheaper if I was painting in my basement and doing it as a hobby. Absolutely. But I'm running it as a business and I'm trying very hard to pay my mortgage with it. And I need to, I need to account for all of those costs. Otherwise I will be very quickly living in a house built of canvases <laughs> with no other roof <laughs> around me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. So let's talk some numbers here. So, we're going to talk a little bit now about how much we sold. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have a froggy throat this morning. It's just not great for podcasting. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how much we sold. We're not going to go into actual revenue numbers because um, our businesses are so different. I don't think that would be helpful. Heather's items sell at a much higher price point than mine do. So, um you know, a $500 painting versus a $6 greeting card. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the revenue different. numbers won't make, won't mean anything to, um, to those of you listening, but we can certainly talk about what we sold and how much of it we sold. 
Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, I had 46 sales on Etsy, which is I sold 46, close to 46 items. So some of them were people bought multiples of an item, but um, 46 sales. And then I also had 14 offline sales. Amazing. So sales that I did in person that were either commissions or orders of product that I had. Amazing. So what is that all together? Uh, 14 and 46 is 60? 60, yes. Yeah, look at wow, me doing math you. in my head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, awesome. So, so let's say 60 sales, yeah. That's awesome. Not that's too, awesome. Not, not too I bad had, for six months. That's no, that's no, essentially no six kidding. months worth of sales. Yeah, that's amazing. I had um, twenty sales, and now I'm just talking. Uh, so actually, I'm going to divide this up. So I had of my artwork, so like proper on canvas artwork. I had twenty sales selling twenty four pieces. So I had a couple of people who bought multiples, or somebody right. who came back and bought again, um, which is awesome, and then. That is, and just to put that in my perspective, so I sold, that's a total of 24 paintings that I sold this year. Last year, I sold five paintings. Wow. And so, yeah, um, but the year before that, I sold 12 paintings. And so last year was a really slow year because we moved. I had no place to paint for two months. We were basically homeless. Like there was a whole bunch of different things. Right. So anyway, <laughs> now we're here. I have a place to paint that I need to pay for. So it's a good thing I sold all those things. But then in addition to that, I did a, a really crazy random collection of Christmas decorations that yeah, I made. Yeah, include that. Include that. <laughs> yeah, hand painted Christmas decorations. So I did those. I counted them separately from the art. I had, uh, I think it was a dozen sales when I did it in the summer, and then I've had just another dozen or so sales on this round of uh, Christmas decorations again. But within each of those sales, three, four, or five products were sold on each because it was, you know, little little ornaments. So it was like a, a multiple. Right. And then on Redbubble, which is very new for me, I want to say what, within six weeks I've been doing it, two months I've been doing Redbubble. Um, I've had 35 products sold on wow. Redbubble. Wow. That is way more than I expected you to get from Redbubble, to be very frank. Uh, <laughs> honest to goodness, I'm more than pleasantly surprised. Yeah. I have no sales, no sales on Society6 yet, but I've been on Society6 like a week and a half. Yeah. Um, and I'm being very deliberate about putting different products in both shops. I want to see how they do. I'm trying to compare the two platforms, et cetera, et cetera. They have different profit margins for artists, so I'm I'm being very deliberate about what I put in right. places. Um, but yes, I'm totally surprised at that, frankly. And I, every time I get an email from Redbubble saying you made a sale, I do a little happy dance. And then that happy dance turns into a giant kick in the ass. Heather, what the F took you so long to do this? <laughs> you could have been making, because honestly, like it's $2 here, it's $2 there. But as my beautiful Nana said, God rest her soul, mind the pennies and the dollars will mind themselves. Mm -hmm. And those 35 products add up. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, $5 here, $20 there, $40 here, $3 there. That really adds up. And then I also sold um, two <laughs> large murals that are at businesses. So, mm -hmm. and, and that's a big part of um, my focus for 2021 is building up that mural business. Hence the taking out of insurance and other big expenses. But yeah, yeah. 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 The mural is a different, the mural business is a different animal in that sense. It's very, um, there's a lot of, like you said, uh, work safe insurance yeah. things that have to be taken into consideration, especially if you're climbing up on ladders and ladders. doing things on other people's commercial property. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so there's definitely, um, a, a whole different, level of um business admin type stuff that goes along with that so yeah totally and I, but I will say and maybe and this is just a slight caveat but I will say the importance of community and you would agree with me here I think Melissa that even though so I made lots of sales on Redbubble I want to tell you I bet you 90 percent of those sales on Redbubble are people I physically know. Okay, so that was, <clears throat> this wasn't in the list of questions that we had talked about for the, the episode, but it was a question that when you mentioned Redbubble, I wanted to ask you, um, mm -hmm. is how much 
of your sales and you don't have to give an exact number for this because it's kind of it's it's a out of left field question but how much of your sales do you think were to people that you that are in your personal network because I know for me it's a very high percentage like like yeah whenever somebody would, buys would, something would, of mine that I who I don't know like I get an Etsy notification it's somebody I don't know I am gobsmacked <laughs> like <laughs> yeah yes yes I'm totally with you and and so I would say like <clears throat> It was maybe two years ago, I had some um, paintings hanging in a local floral shop and I sold paintings to, to strangers. And that was the first time that that happened. And then last year, any painting I sold was to people I know. Like I've been in their house for dinner. I know them that well. Um, and then this year, this is where I've had, and like it's totally random, like somebody will reach out to me on Instagram and say, I, I love your Instagram. I love your colors. I want to commission a painting. And I'm like, how did you find me? And they're like, oh, I was just looking through Instagram. And, or, or they connected the dots. They saw me at a gallery and then they followed me. And, right. But you're a stranger. Like, you, I have no idea who you are. And I would say this year my number of stranger purchases was probably up to 30%. But even still, like 70% of my sales are people who... I know, or they shop at the bike shop, and so they know my husband, and they sort of feel like they know me. Um, yeah, and I would say, I bet you with one exception, so like 99% of my Redbubble sales are friends and family. Yeah, that's really interesting, yeah. and I'm very much in the same boat, which is wonderful <laughs> at the, on the one hand, but also a little concerning on the other hand. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, exactly I have some very lovely customers I, I have so I think most of my very close friends have purchased something from me in the last year <laughs> and then I also have like the next tier of people people who have been following me on Instagram for years some of whom I know in person some of whom I just know through Instagram um, but I wouldn't necessarily say they're they're friends but they're definitely in my circle I guess my circle. social media yeah. circle and um and they buy and I have a couple <laughs> in that group who who purchase from me regularly they are repeat customers I have one who is actually um been purchasing each of my prints and she's collecting them for her grandkids which is super sweet makes me just oh feel gosh, all I know it makes me feel all just warm and fuzzy inside like the fact yes, that yes <laughs> my heart skip a beat that's such a beautiful wow I would cry if somebody told me they were she's doing just that with a, my oh, she's 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 lovely and she's just such a sweet person as well um and then I've had a few people who've reached out to me for um commissions via um mm -hmm. Instagram and stuff like that so those are people who've been following my art for a long time and that's mm -hmm. where I start to get a bit concerned because as I said I don't have a huge following. I have um, just shy of 2,000 people. And, you know, how often can I go back to that well? I need to expand yes. that. Like, it, it's wonderful that these people have bought for me. And it's wonderful that some of them are repeat buyers. But um, And some of them will probably continue to be repeat buyers for a long time. But at some point, people are tapped out. Um, yes. You know? Yes. And, and that's what I've been trying to figure out is how do you get them – because, you know, when I launched the, I thought, okay, this is great. It's passive income. Mm -hmm. But the number of people who reached out to me and they're like, I love that giant painting, but I, one, don't have the space for it and two, can't afford it. But buying this $9 notebook gives me the opportunity to have this super cute piece right. of your artwork in my home at a very, and so I feel like it's making art more accessible, which is a really awesome thing. And I, and I hope, you know, the more they look at that $9 notebook that they're like, you know what, I'm going to keep putting $5 aside so that I can save up for that big painting because yes. this yeah. is, this is something I want, you know, I'm, I'm hoping it heads in that, that direction. At the same time, I, you know, a girlfriend of mine bought a whole bunch of um, notebooks for her kids to take to school because she's just like no they're really cute and they're cute notebooks and boom they're like cute. <laughs> and, and and they're support and they're supporting a friend right like if I'm gonna go spend 10 bucks on a notebook I'd rather give you know some of that money to a, a friend which I think Absolutely. is really lovely especially right now right yeah that's I mean that's how I shop like 99 percent of the mm -hmm. time <laughs> in my in my life if, if I can support yes. somebody I know who's doing what makes them happy I will always try to do that first so totally. 
we'll get into like marketing and stuff for 2021 in a minute but what so let's just go through a couple of these other questions for 2020 fairly Mm -hmm. quickly so what new things did you try in 2020 um and which ones really worked and which ones are you like yeah not so much (laughs) yeah so that's a good question i'm still i'm the the so the mural thing if you looked at it from a business standpoint you might say it's not working so much if you looked at it from a pure passion standpoint you're like man girl go for it (laughs) um i would say i wasn't charging enough early on i did take a project on this year that was free to build my portfolio um and i have just invested in some tools to make it a more profitable proposition in the future so that's so that's definitely something that I, I wouldn't say it didn't work. There was just a lot of fine tuning to kind of figure my shit out. Um, and then something that I tried, and funny enough, and I hope I hope you and I have talked about it because I feel like we have. But mm-hmm. I, when I when we recorded our first episodes, I went back and listened to them, and one of the things that I heard myself say was that I hate hearing no. And then I also heard myself say, uh, which is very much true, I hate hearing no. But then the other thing I heard myself say was, I just don't do small. And what I heard there was a statement, but I also heard myself telling me no. And that's weird. Because if I hate hearing no, why am I willing to accept it for myself? Yeah. And so I challenged myself to say, Heather, if you, quote, can't paint small, why not? try small. And so I set myself a goal of painting on smaller canvases and in fact, uh, signed up and was invited to participate in a gallery show that I'm participating in right now. Uh, that is all paintings that are no bigger than a square foot. And I signed up and said, I am going to deliver 10 paintings to you December 1st for this gallery show. They're all going to be a square foot in size. And I, had 10 square foot canvases all made up and lined in front of me in my studio. And I went, oh my God, what have I done to myself? And I've already sold three of them. Um, and I've had commissions for more small pieces as a result. Awesome. Which is awesome. And so that challenge to myself to say, yes, I can do it. Or yes, at least I can try. Yeah. Was a really was a really cool moment for me, I think. Like, yeah. Yeah, I was very excited when I saw you had all those canvases done. I think that's um, that's great. And I really also loved, and you mentioned that you sold, I think, a dozen in the, the summer and a dozen... Um, yeah, the Christmas this, one. The Christmas yeah. ornaments. That was really different for you too, but I thought that was a really neat um, way to, again, make make your work more accessible and they were really fun it was a very it was it was a different departure from from what you paint Paint. normally you were still painting but (laughs) um it was really they were really fun and I think I think if you had been able to do in-person markets this year I think those would have flown off the shelf Um, like hot cake yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, just in terms of the, the marketing aspect and being a whole person, I think the reason those were, I mean, they were successful because they're super cute and they're really fun and who doesn't love fun Christmas ornaments. But I also think it showed another side of Heather mm-hmm. and it showed it got it maybe got people to know me a little bit more. Right. You know, because mm-hmm. I'm talking about my favorite Christmas movies and my love of swearing and all of those <laughs> things and combining them all into Christmas ornaments. Heather's but the that, reason we have an E on this podcast. <laughs> But now that we have an E, it's like all bets are off. So whatever. We can both swear to our I'm putting that on my LinkedIn. That is like, I have the goal achieved, 2020 mission. Uh, But that is like, that, it, people got to know me more. And Mm -hmm. I think that helped. Um, I can only think that that will help me sell more of my bigger pieces in the future and have more people say to somebody else, have you heard of? Um, Definitely, because I think with your products, your your big paintings, you know, they are a big investment for yeah. for most people, and most people don't think. Um, I mean, it's a very specific audience who has over five hundred dollars to invest in a piece of art. That's that's not a lot of us, 
but yeah. or it's not that it's not a lot of us it's just not something a lot of us think about yeah like if we had an extra five hundred dollars there's not many of us who would be like oh I'm gonna go buy a painting with that they're they're yeah. gonna be like no I'm gonna go buy a new phone or a new you know put it towards a new laptop yeah. or whatever um and so I think if you can bring people in with something small and they they really love it that really paves the way for them to start thinking about yeah you know what I really want a Heather Travis above my mantelpiece or in the bedroom or in my office or wherever but even the same for you, right? Like you could buy a couple of stickers. That's only, you know, that's not a huge purchase. But then I could buy, as I did, all of my Christmas cards from you. And that's that's not an it's still a different price. I mean, it's still a different, still price, a different price point. <laughs> but still, you know, I could have gone to you. You could go to Winners and buy something. But you, you sure. could choose to go. And that's where, because you're in my mind and I'm thinking, right? And I hope that it's those introductory items Definitely. that you get get people in right? it, it's just like you know when you go to an art gallery or, or something like say you go to the ego or the um the vancouver art gallery or something like that and you're seeing like a monet exhibit right none of us well very few of us i think are ever going to have a monet in our house mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know what you walk away you go through the gift shop and you buy a little pack of monet postcards because you love the work but and you can have a little piece of it but you know it's it's just opening up your work to a broader audience totally. which is always a good idea um I just finished watching Emily in Paris while I was working on digitizing some art on the weekend. I just played the entire series. Um, and there's that scene where she's talking to the really famous designer um, who kind of blows her off because she has like a little key charm, um, like a little charm on her handbag, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she's telling him like, you know, me and my friends, we worshipped you when we were in high school and being able to have that little charm was a way to be part yeah. of what you do yeah. um and and that's exactly what this is it's just you you can't afford a 500 hundred dollar painting or a thousand dollar painting yeah i know that's a big investment but here you can get a notebook with the painting on it yeah or, so yeah. yeah and so uh, what about for you um so one of the things a couple of things that worked for me this year um one of the things that i did do was i signed up for a free course um, so there's a podcast that I listen to that I absolutely love. I don't know if you listen to it, Heather. It's called The Product Boss. Oh, uh, no. The Product Boss Podcast. And um, they are two women who the entire podcast focuses on people who make products and sell them. And I have learned a ton from it. And back in August, uh, they ran a free five-day boot camp to help people plan their holiday promotions. And it was probably the most useful free program I have ever gone through, ever. Wow. It was so good that I actually signed up for their big paid program, which ah, was a see, big investment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, which I have yet to work my way through. That is one of my goals for um, once I get through December. That's, that's a big thing on my list. But anyway, in that program... Um, you basically every day there was different tasks to help you prep for the holiday season in terms of all your promotions that you were going to run for your products and I had the idea of doing a pre-order for boxed Christmas cards this is something I'd been thinking about doing for a while I didn't know if they would sell I didn't know if there would be interest so I put them on sale I did a pre-order on um, Facebook just my personal Facebook feed, not my Facebook page, uh, for pre-orders. If you were interested, you could message me, pay via e-transfer, and your Christmas cards would ship before the end of September. So you'd have them for October. And I didn't know how that would go. And it went incredibly well. I sold a ton of boxed Christmas cards. Um, and I also had them on Etsy. I sold quite a few on Etsy as well. And I was super happy with that. And, and I would never have thought to do it if I hadn't done that free program. <laughs> so the free program was a good thing that I did. And then yeah. just thinking uh, ahead. And I also had um, two commissions that came out of that. People who wanted Christmas cards, but um, instead of Miss Doodle, they wanted me to do 
misdoodleized versions of their family. Right. Cool. Um, and I also had one that was uh, somebody wanted a French customization. So we're in Canada. There's people who who speak French here, <laughs> and um, so I had some some people who wanted um, a French version of the card, which was a really simple customization for me to do. Yeah. So that was a, a really and the thing, the interesting thing about that was that I tried to do customized Mother's Day cards. So, um, so you could commission me to do a misdoodleized version of your family for a Mother's Day card. So single one-off card. And that flopped. <laughs> and so I really didn't know if the Christmas, the box Christmas cards would work. But they did. And I think the reason for that was um, that doing a customized single card so it would be an original work of art essentially what it was and the getting the pricing right around that was really challenging um and they took a lot more time than I thought they would take me um, yeah. and so I wasn't and and they were just buying one card so it's a, it was a lot of money to spend on one card you know mm -hmm. whereas box cards is a different different matter right people expect to um spend a little more so, so that was really interesting it was my I think it was my tops it was it was my top selling item for Amazing. the year it was also my most expensive item for the year so they retailed for um I think it was $40 a box sorry $35 a box mm -hmm. so interestingly the priciest item I had was also the one that sold the best um and then I also introduced die cut stickers. I got a um, Cricut cutting machine mm -hmm. um, that I used to make die cut stickers. Those have done quite well. But my bread and butter has been my prints. So the, the Christmas box Christmas cards were great, but the prints have done really well. Um, and I have a couple of single greeting cards that have also done really well. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's that's what worked for me. Um, but yeah, taking that program was totally worth it. And they do run it every year. So if you have an opportunity to take it next year, I really do recommend it. It just made the Christmas selling season so much easier. I was so prepared. Yes. Um, and that, I, you know, it's funny. It's not, it's not half of it. It's being prepared. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. But it was just all, it was all sorted out at the end of August. I knew what I was doing. I had the yeah. graphics made. I was just, I was ready to go. <laughs> it yes. was great. It was such a yeah. practical. So sometimes those free programs are really just a waste of time like they're yeah. you don't learn anything you don't actually accomplish anything and you know they're just kind of very fluffy but this was this was such a great one so uh and, and, and so i have a question for you yeah did so the fact that it was the priciest item in your shop is that going to affect your pricing strategy or any of the products or things that you're thinking of releasing in the future yeah. i know we're we're going to talk 2021 so this is yeah, maybe headed in that so. direction but does that does this <laughs> Does the, I, and I'm just thinking like, wow, that's really interesting insight that your most expensive item was your... It's got me thinking differently for sure. Yeah. Um, and I do have some ideas around that. So before we dive into 2021, I think we we'd pretty much wrapped up 2020. But I guess the one remaining question is like, was what challenged us creatively and from a business perspective in 2020? And we may have already kind of covered that a little bit, mm -hmm. but go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say like... The challenge creatively, I think, was for me, and it's made creatively and business, was I think, like, I really think art, especially, I think art, period, is important in people's lives. Full stop. I think surrounding yourself with beautiful things, I don't mean expensive things, I mean things that make you happy. It could be a leaf that you picked up, it could be a rock that you painted green, things that make you happy in your home, I think are very critically important for well-being. I fully believe that I live by it. That's why my home is the way it is because I believe that your home should make you happy. Mm -hmm. No more and, than this year. I mean, we had to spend a lot of time in our homes this year. It, and that's exactly it. And so this year, you know, the selling online and trying to uh, say that statement, you should be happy in your home. And it's almost, I felt like I was almost guilting people into buying art and I didn't want to do that. And so it was a really weird place to be, to like, I want to speak my truth. I want to tell people that I think they should have beautiful art in their homes. And whether it's my art or somebody else's, just put pretty things up that make you happy. But 
saying that in this climate was a really weird one. This is what this is. And this is why I think the Christmas decorations help. Like I just, I feel like, especially as artists, people need to make more connection to you as a whole person in order to feel like they want to buy from you. And so, cause art I think is really intimidating for people mm-hmm. to, and so I think the more people feel like they know me when they purchase that piece of art, they can now say, this isn't just something I found that I liked. It's this thing that spoke to me that I liked that came from this person who I also like, whether I know them intimately or not. And, and that was to me, I think the biggest challenge was how do we, like there was pivoting the business, right? We talked about mm-hmm. that, like you taking everything from going all to farmer's markets to going online. But I think it was just such a, I think this year was just a really weird year. And also too, and I'm sure you experienced it. I, like my moods were greatly affected this year. Oh, I really time. only paint happy things when I was in a really shitty mood, standing in my studio, mm-hmm. staring at a blank canvas. The last thing I wanted to do was be like, yes, all the hot pink. And it just... And I even debated, funny enough, doing a series based on my mood. And I'm like, what does this departure look like for me? What does this What does this say? And I'm still debating that, funny enough. Mm. But um, I really need to think through, is it worth it? Do I want to put that energy out there? Do I want to experience those feelings again? All of that. Like, I need to, I need to think all of that through, not just the business case for it. But, uh, yeah, like, I think the mood this year really affected us. 100%. It's... <laughs> I I was just thinking about this last week. One of the biggest challenges for me this year was actually not really creating anything new. Like if I look all the all the 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 content the products that I put up for sale, none of it was new. So all of it was artwork that I had, that I created in previous years. But yeah. and that's one of the beautiful things of having created a lot of yes. artwork over the years is I have a lot of stuff that I can take I can digitize I can turn it into prints cards stickers whatever um I don't think I'm just gonna take a quick um so the the only new things I made were some planner stickers those were made from scratch this year um I don't really right. consider those art they're just date stickers and calendars <laughs> But in terms but did of, the, did, but did putting stuff up now? Did that inspire? Did that hopefully inspire you to create more now? It yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be really honest. And it's not that. Yeah. It's just I just have just not been in the mood. I've like I look at my sketchbook yeah. for this year, and there's hardly you know there's a couple of small pieces that I worked on, and I just haven't been this has been a really weird year for me. I have, uh, I do a reading challenge every year where I read 25 books and I was doing great until about March. I was ahead of schedule and I have, I have read one book since March. I'm a bookworm. Um, You know, I have read literally one book since March and you and I both know. Yeah. You're, you're read a book a day if I wanted to. Exactly. And even just like been like TV and watching like Netflix and stuff I have not gotten into I I just I'm just not interested um the only Mm -hmm. thing I've watched this year um like Queer Eye is one of my all-time favorite Netflix series I got halfway through the last season and I haven't watched the rest of it and not not because it was bad or Mm -hmm. or anything I just I just couldn't focus on it and the only thing I have watched from start to finish on streaming is The Queen's Gambit which I loved um, and which actually has given me an idea, which I'm super excited about. And, and Amazing. But, but I still haven't sat down to do it. And it's not something that's going to take me hours. Um, but I had a I had a fun idea for that. So, um, you know, I mentioned I watched Emily in Paris, but I wasn't really watching it. It was just yes. on in the background while I was working. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And yet I have had no issue working. Like I've been very industrious this year mm-hmm. in terms of like... Mm-hmm. But just sitting down and just drawing or sketching or coloring f- because I want to uh, has been... I even have... One thing that people who follow me on Instagram know is every year I buy the Blue Line uh, coloring wall calendar. Yeah. And I color yes. in the months every year. 
I bought a new one in August. I colored August. I haven't colored any of the other months. <laughs> like just, I don't know. It's, um, and it's, it's all related to just this sort of feeling of malaise that 2020 yeah. has brought about. And so, yeah. um, yeah, that's been my challenge this year. I really, um, I can't rely on old artwork to get me through forever I need to start creating some new stuff and just as much for myself as for anyone else so yeah um, totally and I would say more, more importantly for yourself I mean, yeah who, um who cares about the rest of us so like uh, you really uh, yeah the only yeah the only original things I've created have been commissions, commissions. and uh, that's that's been it it's really quite a bummer <laughs> you know like I, yeah I don't I, I'm know. with you though because I, and I and to me, I, I mean, I sort of class, I classify myself as an intuitive painter. I really don't start and even commissions funny enough, unless somebody has given me very specific direction, mm -hmm. which I don't love. Um, <laughs> uh, and I try, I try not to accept commissions where I'm getting very specific direction. Um, it is, I just paint what I, I paint what I feel and I paint with my heart. And when your heart is covered in cobwebs, like I just, I do, it's not like my, my heart has shrunk. I'm not the Grinch, but I feel like there's just so much out there right now that even my, my brain is never quiet enough to let my heart just paint right now. And that's, mm. yeah. That's and that's an interesting way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. But, but funny enough, I just completed and I haven't taken a photograph of it because I've been waiting for the perfect light. And today, in fact, when we hang up our call is going to be the perfect light this afternoon because we've got sunshine, but we, I just finished what I would classify as the closest to a self portrait I will ever get in a painting. It's completely abstract. Like you would never look at it and be like, well, damn, that's Heather. Like there's no way <laughs> it's a whole bunch of colors on a page, but it's like the most, um, emotionally connected. I felt to a painting in a while in terms of creating something. And I was really delighted to complete it. Cause it just, it felt, I was like, woo, I put the last streak on, which funny enough happened to be hot pink, but I thought to myself, I'm like, damn girl, that's done. That's awesome. And I was super happy with it. Whereas I think a lot of things and funny enough, I just finished a really big commission. Um, that's like a, a big deal. I was just commissioned. Well, it was a while ago, but obviously I had been working on it. I was commissioned. So they saw it in the restaurant, the woman, uh, she's the director of the Bruce County Cultural Museum, which is the local museum up here. They purchase three paintings every year from local artists, and they bought one from me. They, in fact, commissioned one that's going to hang in the museum's permanent collection, which amazing. is, like, amazing. <laughs> I was so chuffed. But I have gone back to that painting. I want to say I finished it. Okay, I don't want to say I finished it. I felt like it was sort of finished-ish. Uh, at like maybe a week and a half ago, but I've gone back to it every day because there's just, I feel like there's just something wrong. And normally, normally when I'm done, done, it's just like, I'm done. And I walk away. Mm. Whereas this, I just, I, I, it's like something's hanging over something's me. Something's not I, sitting right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny. Cause I think I got it to that place last night and I walked back up again this morning into my studio and I'm like, I like, you know, close my eyes until I open them up really quickly and looked at it. And I'm like, yes, I still feel the same way. Okay. Thank goodness. Cause it's such a, and I, and I think anybody who's not an artist feels very um, like, what is wrong with you when I, when we talk like this, but it is such an emotional thing. The yeah. creative process, right? It really is. And it's, um, it's not burnout. I don't feel burnt out. No. It's not in the set in the way that I have in the past. It's just, um, yeah, I, cobwebs on your heart is such a good way to put it. Yeah. It just feels like I, 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 and in my brain, I just feel like I need yeah. somebody to come in with a duster and yeah. sweep it all away and be like, oh, and I, and I think too, funny enough, because art and creativity is such a an emotional, I think that's why the business side of it does get so tricky. Yeah, definitely. Okay, Perfect. so I think we've done a really good review of how things went for us in 2020 was there anything you wanted to add about 2020 in terms of just from, yeah. a, from a business perspective or I'd say from a business perspective this was the year that I really started to so you and I started talking more business because of the podcast and I think because of that I started maybe thinking more business-minded a little bit more actively um 
maybe my husband would argue I should have started thinking more actively about the business side a while ago. <laughs> but anyway, um, but I also have started looking elsewhere. So one of the things that I don't do online is I don't follow a lot of artists because I very greatly fear the imitation game. Yeah. Um, and so, but one of the, the groups that I did start following this year were muralists. Their names are Roxy and Phoebe, and they run a company called Pander Designs. And it's, uh, I think they're out of, I want to say Texas, I could be wrong, but they're muralists and they talk a lot about the business side of it. And I think because it's muraling and it's so in isolation compared to my, the other side of the art business, following them and being inspired by them and learning on the business side from them has been really, really helpful for me. They have a number of pricing guides for muraling. Mm. They have some workshops and that I found really, really helpful. It's because of them. I went out and purchased insurance and like, for instance, they have in their pricing guide, they say, you know, list out, not just the price that you're putting in there, but what's included in that price and included in that price is, you know, the time it takes to paint, multiple revisions, but also included in that is all of my ladders, paint supplies, having insurance, all like all of those things are included in the price so that it's very, very clear when you're submitting that quote. And that has been really helpful for me this year mm. was, was so that when I go in now, I feel like when I'm going into the pitch process, I feel better armed in knowing what it is that I'm about to pitch them with because it's not just I have this awesome idea and I think we should work together. I yeah. feel a little bit much. Yeah. You feel more confident that, in what you're doing and just feel more confident in it, especially because it's a, such a different avenue. Yeah. It's, it's very just like different. You going on Etsy, like it's a totally different avenue. Right. Yeah. And it's like, I've never done this before. I've, you know, you, you've hosted national conferences with hundreds of people and people flying in from all over the world. And that, now and I'm worried like, about putting a $6 card on Etsy. Like, is the card stock good enough? <laughs> right? And that's exactly it because it's the, the whole thing. And that was another funny enough thing was, is the card stock. That was my big fear jumping on Redbubble and Society6 mm. was, is putting my product when somebody buys this, is something going to show up and it's going to be completely crap. Yeah. And that's now associated with my name and I, and that was very worrying for me and I read a lot of reviews and it, and I would love to use the Redbubble data to give me an understanding of what products I could make myself and control myself yes. but I think that's a bigger much bigger fish and that's for when our, our 2021 discussion but I <clears throat> I think it was the controlling aspect of the Redbubble thing that was a little scary this year yeah no those are all yeah. really good points for sure mm -hmm. Okay, so Heather and I had a sidebar, which you guys didn't get to hear. <laughs> and we've decided, um, just because of how the conversation was going, that we're actually going to split this into two episodes. And so um, this episode we're just gonna, is just going to be about our 2020 year in review. And so next week, we're going to be back with um, what we're doing for 2021. And secretly, we're going to record it right now, like right after this one. So but it'll be next week for you guys <laughs> because the magic of technology. <laughs> exactly. I don't have my own DeLorean yet, despite my 30 year desire to have my own DeLorean. So we're going to be back next week. We're going to dive into what our plans are for 2021. We're both super excited about what we've got planning, but I hope that our review this year really uh, shed some light on what goes on in the background behind starting your own business that is based on your art or what you create or make um, and just giving you some things to think about. Uh, and if, if you're just starting out too, hopefully it was just nice to hear that you're not alone with all these thoughts that are swirling in your head and, you know, things that you feel you need to research. And it, there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into it. And when you're starting from scratch, you know, Angelina Brogan's been on the show multiple times. And one of the things that she says quite often that I love is that um, you can't afraid, be afraid to be a beginner and yes. uh, and that's really good advice so we will be back next week uh to talk about 2021 thank you all for being here this week and we will talk to you soon thank you so much for joining us for the and she looked up creative hour if you're looking for links or resources mentioned in this episode you can find detailed show notes on our website at and while you're there be sure to sign up for our newsletter for more business tips profiles of inspiring Canadian creative women, and so much more. If you enjoyed this episode, 
please be sure to subscribe to the show via your podcast app of choice so you never miss an episode. We always love to hear from you, so we'd love it if you'd leave us a review through iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Drop us a note via our website at anshelookedup.com or come say hi on Instagram at anshelookedup. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.